know how the court took Tracy, but I don't worry about it. So I'm asking for it. I don't blame him. And we did. Hang a high tree went to the Thames. When is she gone? When is Tracy leave? Uh, first of March, I thought. Was it end of February? I think it's the end of March. Oh, so she's got some time. Yeah, I think it's But she's out a lot. So she'll still be out a lot. Yeah. Yeah, she's out a lot. Uh, using those funds. Uh, 
if you want to use it for the park system. Uh, the 4B fund, of course, is dedicated to providing funding for parks and the recreation trails and open space. The uh, 4B fund right now uh, is relatively uh, tapped out. We have some reserves. They're relatively small. Uh, so you're going to have some questions, I'm sure, in your mind. Uh, they're in our minds as staff as well and consultants as to how to deal with some of the concepts and issues that are going to be raised during this presentation. Uh, for example, how to deal with uh, the possibility of doing some kind of new recreation center, how to deal with the possibility of doing any kind of uh, indoor or sanatorium, indoor pool or sanatorium, how to uh, adjust your provision of recreation centers to uh, and senior centers to the demands that uh, we feel like might be happening in the future. And by the way, a lot of what we're doing here, because we are planning for the future, is based on some assumptions or projections or beliefs as to what will happen in the future in terms of service delivery and service demand. Uh, those are, as always, when you're dealing with projections in the future, somewhat speculative. Uh, so this is a draft plan. This is not by no means written in concrete right now. And the council wants to take things off, move things forward, move things back, adjust things. Uh, have us look at different strategies. Uh, now's the time to do it. That's why we're taking it to you at this point in time and asking for your feedback. So with that, I'm going to give it over to Bob. We've got the uh, folks that he's worked with from Hampton Associates in developing this plan with the uh, park board. And uh, he can uh, introduce them and uh, they'll take the presentation. Good morning, Mayor Council. We're happy to be here. We started on this process of uh, February of 2009. So we've been working on it for a good time, trying to put together a fairly comprehensive plan, as Bob <coughs> mentioned. Uh, there are a couple of things in it that it really doesn't address, however. Um, it really doesn't address much out at Lake Park due to the fact that we have the lake development study that was ongoing. So we, we didn't do anything there. And then, of course, we have a new awareness of our ADA needs, and there's some ADA issues out there that haven't necessarily been addressed with this. Uh, but other than that, you'll see it's fairly comprehensive. Uh, there's, there's a lot of food for thought here. Um, we did have a lot of public input with this, and there was a telephone survey that was done as well. Uh, Half and Associates has been our team on this. Um, and I'll, uh, Lenny Hughes um, is, is the team leader here, and I'll let Lenny introduce his team and get going with the presentation. Well, thanks, Bob. Again, my name is Lenny Hughes, I'm the director of Lenny's Park Fish and Planning and Half Associates. And our team here today is project manager Francois DeCock, uh, Adam Wood, deputy project manager, and Dwayne Brinkley from Brinkley Sergeant Architects. Uh, they've been working on the recreation facility plans of this national plan for your city. At this point, I'll give it over to Francois and Adam to uh, lead the presentation today. Thank you, Bob. Mayor, Council, and City Manager, thank you for this opportunity to present to you today. And indeed, as the City Manager has pointed out, this is a vision for the long, for the long term. And what you do right now is if you decide you want to move forward on this, that's how you see yourself eventually achieve greatness for your city. It always starts with that vision, that dream. That vision and dream came from the community. It came from visiting with you. It came from staff. So today, we really represent to you what we've learned from the community. And we hope that you will support this and see this as truly the way to go forward for your city. Um, quickly, the agenda. Uh, we talked about the consulting team, uh, some of our initial impressions of the, the park system in your city. We'll talk about vision and goals. We'll talk about some public input because that's where we learned about what the community wants uh, for your city. We'll generally talk about parks and open space, outdoor recreation, as well as aquatics and indoor recreation. And then we'll have an action plan. And that action plan is really the pathway and the roadway for the future. Us as the main consultants, the prior consultant, have associates, we're really responsible for project management. We are uh, responsible for parks and open space planning and analysis. We really look at your, your system as a whole and the service that you provide. 
uh, we were responsible for, for public participation. We facilitated that process and then also um, helped with visioning by taking all that information and come up with a vision that everyone will support and have buy-in, because that is important um, indeed to have the buy-in from the community. And then an implementation plan that we are also responsible for. Um, Dwayne, who Lenny introduced, Prince Sergeant Associates, they're responsible for the indoor recreation and aquatics. And they really know and understand the industry. They've been in the industry for, a, for many, many years and have seen what happens in the surrounding area in North Texas. And they can respond appropriately to give you the best possible recommendations for your future um, in the city. And then as part of the public input, we had a telephone survey. And Raymond Turco is not here today. He did the study uh, based on the questions that, that we as as the consultants together with staff and together with council and city manager has put together as questions that need to go out to the community so that we can learn again from them what is important. So the question is what, what were our initial impressions of the parks of your city and of the recreation facilities? Now because we do so many parks, park plans in the community, more than 20, 30 in the last 10 years, we really get a good sense of where you stand in comparison with other cities. Well, first of all, you really have a good distribution of parkland, a good network of parkland, um, and, and some good facilities. However, they, some of them really need some upgrade and, and some improvement. The basic amenities are there, and the equipment are there, but how can you go ahead and, and perhaps improve that? You also have the um, railroad park, which has recently been complete, and what a beautiful facility that is. A wonderful um, um, recreation facility that you provide there, it's really comprehensive, it's state of the art, and that's in a sense the standard that I think that you've set for yourself that we want to achieve that uh, for the future. We did notice that um, in some of the parks, there's some minimal landscaping, and we can look at that and how that can be improved, specifically with sustainable low water requirement landscaping. I think that would be the key when we look at, at improving some landscaping in the park areas. And then about the recreation centers, some of them are small, and they really need to be upgraded, um, but they are well maintained, and that is what is important. They're there, people use them, people are proud of them, and it's a, an important amenity for your city. Looking at vision and goals that this plan set for. First of all, we made the vision active, adventure, creative connections. Now this is the same action statement as that we have for the Trails Master Plan. And we felt it's so powerful, it says so much, and it was so successful in, in helping the Trails Master Plan to move forward that we felt it appropriate to apply <coughs> as is to the Parks Master Plan. Because after all, the Parks Plan and the Trails Plan, both of them are the recreation provision for your community. So they need to mesh very well. And through this common statement, we, we believe that's the way to move forward. Again, it's about creating that active adventure for people with trails, with exploring natural areas, and it's also to provide those creative opportunities and connections throughout your city. The specific goals for the plan are these, stay relevant. You know, within the community, within the region, there are certain trends in, in recreation. So it's important to really stay relevant so that you can continue to keep attracting new residents to your community. The young, resident, the young people today, they choose where they want to live, where they want to work. They look at the quality of life opportunities that a city provides. So it's important that through your park system, you also stay relevant. Um, the next one is preserve open space. You have tremendous, tremendous open space um, areas within your city. You've got the creeks, you've got Layla, um, you've got the Trinity, um, L4. All of those, and the lake, all of those are very important destinations and what we've learned through the years is more and more people want to see that protected and they want to have access to that. Because we've, we've lost so much of it in recent years, people realize that and they have a need and a desire to see that being protected. But then also we want to celebrate diversity, whether it's cultural diversity, whether it's the festi fest festivals that you provide along the lake or wherever you do provide some of your festivals, we want to make sure that we celebrate that diversity that you have in your community. Similar to, have, to have how you have some other economic development improvements in your city, your downtown area, this, this complex here. That's all part of the diversity of offerings in your city. 
It's looking at the cultural component, the entertainment component, but also the recreation component. So the diversity is clearly very important. And then be sustainable. The goal for that is to say, let's be economically sustainable, making sure that, as I mentioned, all these developments that happen around your city, make sure that they synergically work together, that they support each other, and through that, provide true sustainability. And also from your policies and ordinances, make sure that you implement it in such a way that you stay sustainable in how you expend your, your, your funding. The next component is to talk about public involvement. And we went through a series of efforts to learn from the community, again, what is important to them. We had some public meetings. We had a vision meeting with department heads where we really learned about what are the day-to-day -day issues that they have to deal with. It had also the benefit, by talking to the department heads, of them talking to each other. Now, what we find sometimes in cities is that departments don't really communicate. I think you communicate well in your city. But it was good to emphasize that as part of the department head discussion that we had. The next step was to do some fact-finding with the parks and recreation staff. That was important. Because, because again, they every day they learn about the issues. People come and tell them about what is lacking, what do they want to see improved, what do they enjoy, what do they really want to see improved, um, 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 promoted and, and be, become even better within the city. So by talking to them, we've learned a lot about the day-to-day -day operation of recreation and where can we improve. How can we help the, people, the person on the ground that deals with the public, how can we help him to do a better job? And basically through him, help to have the image of the city being promoted as well. We then also had an um, interview with some senior center staff as well, specifically people at the senior center because they deal with, with um, the, the public specifically, they see every day what is needed, and we spoke to them as well. And then the sport organizations. After all, they're the ones that make use of the, of the different facilities, the, the, the fields, um, the basketball courts, etc. And we wanted to know how do they see themselves for the future? What is their projection? How do they want to grow? And where do they need support from the city to be able to provide this very important service? Because in a sense, and that's what we look at it, what they provide is parallel and supportive to what the city does. One needs to support the other one in providing this very crucial and necessary recreation um, service to the community. The telephone survey. What we did was we had some, some um, calling done and to be able to get 400 responses, but we had more than 36,000 contacts. But what it means is that someone decides no, they don't want to do the survey or they go halfway and they just put down, they don't want to go further or they just can't get a hold of them. So we had many, many contacts made, but out of that we were able to get 401 responses. Now the way that we always explain and describe the value of a public telephone survey is it's similar to have a big public meeting, or a town hall meeting rather. And in that town hall meeting you have 400 of your community. And each one of those, those people tell you exactly what, what is important to them. Now if you see that in that perspective, it really makes sense that you can gain a lot from the community through this process. It's, de it's defendable scientifically because it's random, people don't know when they will call, they don't know who will be called, so therefore you can't get pressure groups or people that want to, to have certain agendas that they want to, to, to um, forward um, um, for their own benefit. The error rate is 5%. Um, at 95% confidence, that is very high for any survey like this. Um, so we um, feel confident about that as well. So what have we learned in this telephone survey? Well, first of all, we've learned that, that from a, a, a top to bottom importance point of view, in terms of what would people like to see being built in the future, um, out of basketball courts, there was a 2.1 to 1 support for that, they wanted to see that. Youth soccer fields, that was 1.5 to 1. Sand Valley Wall Courts, that was 1.5 to 1. And then youth board baseball fields, 1.3 to 1. Tennis courts, 1.3 to 1. And youth football fields, 1.3 to 1. But that, that shows you the athletic facilities and how people rated them in terms of their importance. In terms of the most important non-athletic facilities, <coughs> because 
what is important to find out from communities today is what is important to them if it's not specifically <coughs> sports oriented or, or um, a comp competition oriented. Because in the past, that's what we mostly focused on, because those were the people that came to council and demand what they wanted to, to have. The majority were quiet, but those are the ones that want to have the trails and want to have the passive open spaces. So from a non-athletic facility, we, we learned that for multi-use trails, for walking and jogging, there was a tremendous support, 5.6 to 1. And it's good to see this, because this then is again supportive of the trails plan, which you have recently um, approved as well. The second one is natural habitat and nature areas, a support of 5.5 to 1. That is tremendous, if you think about it. And again, that's again a reflection of what people today want to see in their communities. If there are natural areas they want to see protected, but they don't only want to see it protected, they want to have access to it, they want to enjoy it and experience the value that it brings to them and their children. In terms of family picnic areas, 3.9 to 1, people like to go out, like to have uh, picnics with their family. <coughs> Road biking lanes, 3.5 to 1. That's also a fairly high support because we often hear in North Texas that with the big trucks and, and the way we think about things, either the, the, the cyclists are too scared to be on the road or the big truck drivers don't like cyclists on the road. So to see that the community says that they would like to see bike lanes and they in support of that in the majority, we must take note of that. The next one is playgrounds. Um, again, 3.5 to 1. And that's, a, that's a general and a, and a very specific item that will always have the majority support because everyone sees the value of playgrounds. Everyone wants to take their child to go to, to a city playground. And then lake access, because after all, the lake is part of the image of the city. You have a beautiful lake park. That's most probably the, the most important point of access. And people want to be able to see the lake, experience the lake, be, be able to walk along the lake. So that also is, receives a, a majority support. In terms of the most important indoor recreation facilities, what we learned was number one, indoor swimming facilities. They want to see that. This is support of 3.2 to 1. The senior center, they would like to see that as being important to improve at a support of 2.4 to 1. For indoor cardio, weight training areas, people want to go out there, they want to, to exercise, they want to be able to get the recreation from the city, and they support that with 2.3 to 1. For the gymnasium, indoor basketball courts, there's a support for that as well as for rugby groups. So for generally, if you look at facilities, indoor facilities to build, they overall, there's a majority support to see that being improved and being added to what you have currently in the city. Now, if you ask the question, what's the most single important facility to provide? You've given them a long list to consider, and it's in terms of outdoor facilities, it's about um, indoor facilities, it's about active, about the non affiliate facilities. You ask them, well, out of all of that, what are the most important ones? Give us one of all those. So what we learned was that indoor swimming got a 14% support. That is high for an, for an element like that. But by the way, that's also what we see in many communities right now. People want to have those indoor aquatic facilities. They see the benefit, what it brings to other communities. It's they, they go to, to other people, to their friends and families in other cities. They see where it's provided, and they enjoy it and they want to have it in your city as well. Multi-use trails for walking, jogging, 12%. That's also still very high. Um, senior center, 10%. As our community ages, and as the baby boomer group becomes larger, you will see that grow more and more as a very important goal for every city to make sure that they provide for the seniors in the community. Natural habitat, natural areas, again, it's out there. As being the question, what is the one thing that you say is the most important? 8% said that is to them the most important. Indoor walking track, 7% as part of the indoor facilities, and playground, 6%. So it's a very important um, priority list to look at as to how people view that thing that is really something that they feel passionate about. Because if you ask that question about what's the one single most important uh, facility, it is truly the passion that comes out at that time. At this point in time, I want to ask Adam, he's the uh, deputy project manager, to um, the presentation. 
Thanks, Francois. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, more detailed information uh, that the master plan incorporates. In it. Specifically, I'm going to first speak about the parks and open space system, where future parks uh, are proposed, and so forth, um, and, and go through a little bit of that information. When we look at the city overall, um, we, we identify where your parks are located, and we classify them into different types of parks. The two kind of backbone types of parks in your city system are your neighborhood parks and your community parks. Your neighborhood parks are generally going to be five acres, maybe a little bit larger, maybe a little bit smaller, and they typically will have a playground and a pavilion, and then a lot of times uh, kind of a loop trail for people to walk around. That's your basic neighborhood park. That's the, uh, if you look at all of your parks, most of your parks, or the majority of your parks are going to be that single type of park. Your community parks, uh, Railroad Park, uh, Lake Park, uh, Central Park are some examples. Those are going to be larger. Those are going to be uh, generally at least 25 acres. Uh, they can be up to 100, 150 acres in different communities. Different communities have different ways of doing things. Those are going to be kind of your, uh, your big, uh, attractive parks that are going to have a lot more amenities within them. But there can be different types. There can be uh, anything from Railroad Park, which is very much oriented toward active use. There's a lot of ball fields, a lot of energy going on there. To Central Park, which is much more passive in nature. It's a great place for people to go out and walk and, and walk the trail and loop through the woods and so forth and have a, a different type of experience. Uh, but those are really the two key core types of parks within your system. Um, but however, there's also different, uh, there's, there's a few other types of parks. There are linear parks or green belts that are really key, especially when we look at trails and making those connections. Um, and there are special purpose parks that are, that are designed to provide one special uh, type of use. Um, for an example, the, the Vista Ridge Amphitheater would be a special purpose park. It's the amphitheater that's the primary type of use in that location. So I throw all that out there just to kind of tell you how we classify and how we look at the different types of parks within your system. What we then do is we provide these service area radii around each of your parks. And these are just general zones. They're not, they're not precise. But it gives you an idea of what the service area of those parks are. For neighborhood parks, we look at about a half a mile service area. That's, that's within generally easy walking distance for the majority of people. With community parks, we look at about a mile uh, service area, and that's something that can be driven to very quickly. Now, you're never going to get to a point where every single part of your city is, is within these rings, but it, it kind of helps you to see where are the areas that have the best service and where are the areas that are maybe a little bit more lacking. Um, obviously, out in the, in the far eastern portion of the city that doesn't have much development, there aren't as many parks. Um, but you start to see a few areas that do have some development, some residential development, that may not have quite as good a service area as some of the other parts of the city. So that's one of the things we look at in terms of trying to figure out where can we provide new parks or where can we enhance some existing park land by simply adding a playground maybe to, to help provide that better service uh, within different parts of the community. In addition to that service area, we also look at level of service. This is, this is benchmarking. This allows us to compare Louisville to any other city in the Metroplex um, just to get an idea of how you compare, whether, whether you're exactly on par or above or below. Uh, that's something that, that, that you as a, as a community decide where you want to fall within that spectrum. Uh, we express this in the numbers of acre, acres of land per 1,000 people within your community. And what you have today is a total of uh, just over 14 and a half acres of parkland for every thousand residents uh, within Louisville. We break that up into two primary categories, close to home parks, which again, that neighborhood and community, those core backbone uh, parks within your system, uh, those comprise 8.3%. And then other parks, that's everything else, that's your linear parks, your special purpose parks, uh, those are 6.3%. So that's just a little bit of statistics. And just to compare, uh, this is just a few selected cities, just to give you an example of what some other cities look like. Uh, McKinney is very well known for having a very big park system for a lot of land. They have 25 acres per thousand. Um, Keller uh, is known for having a very high quality uh, park system. People in Keller say our parks are great, but they don't have you know, nearly as much as McKinney does if they have a very large level of support. So acreage is only one thing that we look at. The quality also is a really big determinant of how good your system is, how well it serves uh, your community. However, one of the things that we have uh, done in this is recommended a target level of service of 20 acres per thousand. So that's about a uh, five acre per thousand uh, population increase. Uh, really where a lot of this comes from uh, is an increase in your neighborhood parks of two acres from one acre is what you have today. And then an increase in your other park land uh, from 6.3 to 10 acres. Uh, that could uh, take the form of green belts, that could take the form of special purpose parks and so forth. 
um, as, as we move forward. Uh, that gives you an idea of where some targets have been established. Kind of some moment. I was like sure that it wasn't a question. Um, I was wondering if you could address uh, the core property and how you created the core property here and why we had those kind of calculations. Hmm. Um, we, you know, the, the major purpose of of this, of this level of service is to provide you with the tool as a comparison. We did not include core property in that calculation because most cities don't have that resource. Now, the, the core property can definitely be used to, ac to accomplish a lot of some of this open space, for example, um, and shouldn't be uh, just ignored completely. Um, and this shouldn't mean that this is a set in stone minimum standard that absolutely must be uh, achieved. Um, so and so that's basically the purpose of it. Um, that's something we could give you if you're interested in having that information. Um, but it's kind of we're trying to do a little bit more apples to apples versus apples to oranges on that. That's very good question. I'd like to see that because while we're blessed to have something that other cities don't, but sometimes that takes place of what other cities have to build because they don't have that many. Right. So we do. So I'd like to see that included. Plus, the, did you do How many the? Acres? Did you do the? Huh? How many acres are there? I don't know as far as. Say Lima. Uh, Lima. 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 Lake Park, Lima is about 25 acres. And then what about East Hill? Well, with, with Lake Park and East Hill combined, it's close to 800. Plus the Lila. Plus the Lila. And that's a very important uh, point that's going to be 4,000 acres. Yeah, the, the Lila property has restrictions. On it, so you can't do anything you want out there. It is open space, right? Probably because it's trails and things like that. Right. But, and that's it important. It's a part of open space. Right. It's a very important point to make about, well, that's also open space available. It's at a different level, perhaps, the availability of the public. It may be closed at certain times. You may have to pay to go in there sometimes. But it has to be um, considered. That's in terms of the amount of open space. The other factor, which um, Adam also mentioned, is the distribution. Now, it doesn't help you have all this, this uh, natural open space, the, the, the public land, but it's all in this part of the city, but the rest of your city just don't have a distribution of close to a neighborhood box, which, again, is that backbone that you try to achieve. So we have to put that in balance. Yes, you may be blessed with wonderful natural areas, but what, what does it do to your community and your residents? Can they walk to a neighborhood park? Will they have to drive over to go be able to go to those natural areas? And before I uh, forget, did you say we we do have from East. I was going to say we have from East Hill and Lake Park in that calculation. Okay. I also have in, in the table. If, if you if you want to flip around, it's on page forty two of the report. Um, we have a line item for incorporating Lila, and if you put the Lila acreage in, that brings you up to currently twenty one acres per thousand. So it does. It, it's a huge boost. We did not, you know, include the little bit of core land that's up here or some of this that's, you know, really kind of off of the edges. But that is in there. So 21 acres per thousand. And when we look at, you know, uh, that puts you, that puts you on par with South Lake and close to the beginning at that point. And if you did go in and, and grab all those core parcels along where they have a lot of health work that we don't have or, you know, anything like that, it would definitely push you up. But I just want to reiterate Francois's point that, you know, the overall total is one metric to use, but I, I really believe that it's this one and this one that are that are really kind of key to your your population and to to making sure that there's a if you're trying to hit a benchmark because every city has different opportunities. Um, Louisville has a great opportunity having Lila that other cities just don't have, and so if we were to go to Capel, we couldn't tell them you need to have as much as Louisville does because they just simply don't have that. Layla is very restricted and it's not open to the public. Well, it's open to the public. Right. You can go there anytime you want. Right. Except there. I mean, when it's open. Yeah, they're kind of open. They have gate hours. Right. So, so they're all by the core. So they're parked. They're parked at hours. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, but, um, I'm saying it's laid open every day of the week. Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I believe. Right. Just on the weekend. Just right. on the weekend. Is that every weekend? I, when I went through the tour up there, I thought it was only on a certain time. Okay, here it says uh, Friday, Saturday, Sundays, uh, yeah. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. 
activities are scheduled on, on just certain weekends, like the bison tour or the cabin tour, they, they typically have those just once a month. But it is open to the public every weekend uh, this winter. Uh, and for the past three years, we've uh, cooperated and coordinated with them for stocking the river with trout. It's been open for fly fishers. Maybe I'm just thinking about that once a month thing they have. So that's, that's what brings the bell. Right, and it is obviously special purpose type of programming. Right, but what, what it does offer is some amenities that other cities are not able to offer to their residents. It, you're absolutely blessed with that, and, right. and you will see That's later on, we, 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 we say to you, market it. Market it right. to the community, market it to the outside world, so they know what you have. Right. I mean, I've, only when I started to work at Lewisville, and I've been here, before we started to work on this plan, been in, in the data area for about six years or so, I never knew about the bisons that you have, and about the absolutely beautiful, um, um, even paddle trail that you have. So you need to get that word out that you do have this, this um, tremendous amount to the community, but also to the bigger community in the region. One thing I did just also want to point out is I showed these numbers of different cities. These are their, their adopted standard. It's not necessarily what they have today. So uh, the takeaway is not that you're, you're severely deficient compared to everyone else. It's, it's really trying to compare where you want to be versus compared to where, where they want to be. And as Francois mentioned, you know, people choosing where they live based on quality of life versus simply proximity to jobs these days. Um, that's an important thing just to keep in mind. Um, so just looking at that, based on those targets that we established and based upon a, a 2030 population forecast, um, this is kind of the, the deficit of acreage uh, that would occur. Um, you know, 520 currently, if you were trying to meet that 20 acres per thousand, uh, would be the deficit. But looking here at community parks and neighborhood parks, I think that's the more important number for you to consider because as we talked about, there are a lot of ways to say we kind of got the other bit covered with, with Lilo, with the core land and so forth. Um, so just things to keep in mind. Uh, you may ask where might those parks occur? Well again, this is going back to looking at your existing uh, neighborhood, which are the smaller green circles and community, which are the larger kind of orange circles. Um, when we break it down to simply show neighborhood, we have each of these neighborhood parks uh, shown with the half mile radii, as well as your community parks, because they also serve the same function as a neighborhood park plus plus some more. I, on your previous slide, the, the population growth, um, I don't know if you can answer this, but um, does the COG take into account uh, Castle Hills in those numbers? Uh, so, so again, show them where those existing neighborhood, and we call them de facto neighborhood parks, but those are each of your community parks that provide the same amenities as a neighborhood park, plus some. So they, they help serve double duty. We took that and we took your uh, future land use plan and your zoning and so forth and identified where are the single family, multifamily, um, and vacant land that is zoned for residential. Where are those areas of land located? and then which one of those do not fall within a half mile of a neighborhood park. And that's what the resulting pink and orange and yellow uh, represent, the pink being vacant but zone residential. That's just a tool that kind of helps that pop out to see a little bit where those gaps are. And there's always going to be some gaps you know, in, in areas like this that may not be uh, able to be addressed, but there are some larger ones that we may want to explore opportunities to see uh, how can those areas be better served in the future. So what we've done is we've identified a number of locations for potential future neighborhood parks. Um, one of them would be uh, just north of the future DCTA station uh, here on the other side, of, uh, on the eastern side of, of the Old Town area. That may be a good opportunity, especially with all the work that, that you as a, as a city have been putting into redeveloping Old Town and really uh, bringing a lot more residential in and so forth. There, there already has been a lot of uh, motion made in that. This could be a good opportunity to provide some recreational opportunity for uh, that community. Um, this one here is at your existing Oak Bend Park, which is a really beautiful park and it's in a good location, but it doesn't have some of the, the amenities that could help it be a neighborhood park, namely a playground would be a good addition to have there. So some simple work in there, adding a playground, clearing out a small space for it, could, could boost that from a, a just a small open space area to a full neighborhood park and address a, a good bit of the service area deficit. 
Uh, and then we've identified an area at uh, this, uh, um, I forget the name of the elementary school, the elementary school that was kind of south uh, west of this Ridge Mall. Sorry, probably, yeah. That, that, that could be an opportunity to, to partner with the ISD to help them enhance their amenities a little bit and provide a neighborhood park without having to go out and acquire land and, and start from scratch. Again, to help further serve uh, the residential area there. You know, I'd, I'd like to think that my eyes are decent. I can't tell which ones are new versus existing. And I know you've got them marked with some sort of wavy lines. I can barely make that out. Yeah, um, I can tell you if you, if you you want to read along in your? Um, I'm, I'm looking like it's worse here than it is up there. Is it? Sorry. Sorry. Um, oh, you got it. Let me give you mine. There you go. Fifty-four is neighborhood parts, which I'm talking about right now. And then here in a moment, I'll talk about uh, fifty-five. You see how there's kind of the dashed yeah. rings around it. Those, those are the huge ones. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll hold on to this because I know the PowerPoint's always hard to see a lot of these maps. Uh, I'll kind of help you read along a little bit. Um, but anyway, that's just to kind of give you an idea of where some of these future parks could be. Uh, we've shown some out here kind of in the far eastern side. That's, that, is, that would only occur should residential development happen out there. That's not saying that you need to go out and build a park out here where there's no residential currently. It's just to show how to serve those areas if they were developed, uh, if they pay their park uh, dedication uh, fees and, 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 their, and their, uh, their land dedication and so forth, that there be the, the space for that. So you take into account the public parks that are in um, we, we did not look at that uh, in too much detail because of its, its kind of its status within the city. Uh, my understanding is that they don't necessarily serve the same function as neighborhood park. Uh, it, could, it could be corrected that they, they tend to be very, very small and not have much in terms of amenities. And that's that's a there's a lot of gray area in, in making a decision whether they're in or whether they're out. Um, and, and you could look at it either way. Uh, it, it's just trying to say that you know they they may fulfill the needs, but they don't fulfill the exact same function. Maybe a way. To but we haven't really shown anything too much in Castle Bills. Uh, we have one that would be outside that kind of would be in close proximity. We then did the same thing with community parks. And if you want to look at page 55, that's going to be the map we're going to have uh, up next. Again, figuring out where those locations are and doing the same uh, approach we compare that with your zoning and your, and your future land use and so forth to identify where there are residential areas that may have deficit. Well, you'll see on this that there are some large areas on the far western uh, side of town, uh, but there's really not an opportunity to provide a community park out there. And you know, truth be told, the, the, the radii we look at for community parks, we're, we're considering people are driving there anyway. So this just means that there would be a little bit farther driving distance that people would have. However, you'll notice that over on the eastern side, there's really not much of a, of a, of a service uh, or a coverage. Uh, of, of, of community park. In addition, as we look at the, at the community continuing to grow over the next few decades, uh, there will more than likely be a, a significant need for providing additional athletic facilities, additional uh, uh, recreation fields of, of that type to serve that, that growing population. What we've looked at is, and this is not a new idea, but taking some of the land there at the, uh, the East Hill Park land that's leased from the core, not the park that's recently been built and finished, but, but the, the land is just uh, nearby to that. And that potentially being a community park in the future. I know that the city has looked at that in the past, uh, of having a concept for that. And we think that that's uh, potentially a good path to continue following when the need for that arises in the future, when the demand uh, necessitates that. So just to break down the, the recommendations for, for parks in the future, we have the city divided into four zones. Um, and this is the same thing we followed with the telephone survey. We, we, with the telephone survey, we looked at people in different sectors of the city. Everything east of 35 is one big zone because the population is so small in that area. Uh, we also have uh, a zone that is uh, basically uh, Main Street North. Uh, we have one that's from Main Street to, I think it's the is that I also can't read the maps on the screen. Uh, um, but that just kind of gives you a general idea of the locations. It, and so you'll see that a lot of these uh, new park sites that we have identified are in sector one, which is the far eastern, uh, and then a couple in sector four, which is the southern. 
Sector three, which is this kind of central area of town, we don't have any new recommendations. But one thing I'll point out is of the five parks in sector one, one of them is on land that the city already has. One of the, the, the community park is on land that the city already has uh, some access to. Uh, in sector two, it's on existing parkland you already have. And then in sector four, one of those is on existing parkland and one of those is on existing <coughs> land. So we've tried to really maximize your existing resources rather than identifying a bunch more land to go out and purchase. Uh, some additional recommendations we have in there would be the uh, land for Eastside Recreation Center. Glenn's going to talk about a new recreation center in a little bit. That's just a consideration. It's figuring out where can that be placed. Can it be placed on existing land we have? If so, that would be great. Um, but there may be a consideration for having to, to find that land. Uh, there's a recommendation in the plan for a special events park. Uh, Louisville has, you know, Western Days, with, with, all, with all the things you do, you all have a lot of uh, really great special events. And the, the downtown, the old town area is a good venue for that, but there was also a, a good bit of discussion and maybe nice to have uh, something dedicated that you could have a little bit longer events, that you could have something that, that was specifically designed in some way to accommodate those types of special events and festivals. Uh, there are recommendations for various special purpose parks. A lot of those end up being trailheads, but the trail plan that you adopted uh, almost a year ago, uh, there's, there's a, a lot of locations in there for figuring out where to get people onto the trail. If they're coming from their car, how to get them out of their car and onto the trail. Or if they're walking, how to get from the neighborhood onto the trail. Uh, little, little pockets of land here and there will need to somehow be uh, designed for that purpose. Uh, open space acquisition, first I'll mention the importance of that. There are some recommendations in there. Uh, a lot of them, I think, if you look at, will be able to be accommodated with working with the Corps of Engineers to figure out some way to have partnerships with some of that land and get people access onto it. Uh, Lake Park Improvement Week, you know, Bob mentioned we didn't look at that too much in depth, but there, there is a little bit of uh, kind of incremental improvements that if, if things were to, to stay as they are, a few small improvements that could be made, um, but there are, there's obviously the opportunity there to, to do a lot uh, of improvement uh, in the future to, to maximize that, that, that park's potential. You know, the, the lake is named after your city, and that's really the one place that people can really get access to it. Is, is right in that, in that area. So it's a very critical um, piece of parkland within your community. And then river access points are also described. Uh, in the trail plan, we have a, a paddling trail that we've identified with some, some different river access points uh, to provide places for people to get in the water with their canoe or kayak and places for them to get out of the water. Those would also be great opportunities for people just that, that are not going to get on the water to go out and have an overlook or to have a pier or something like that where they could experience that environment as well. Uh, so the, the action plan for the land acquisition for the higher priority is basically 315 acres, um, which we've estimated to be about $31.5 million. And you'll see that asterisk, this footnote is down here, that there are a lot of ways that you could really reduce those costs by utilizing some existing land for your side of recreation center or for your special events park. Uh, and, and as we talked about, utilizing some of that core land, if possible, for open space preservation. Uh, park development and improvement. Uh, $18 million would be incorporated in there, and I'll go ahead and throw out that that also includes the first phase of the Trails Master Plan of about $8 million, which, you, which was in the plan that you've already seen. Um, so we've incorporated that into there. So totaling, again, $49.6 million, but keeping in, in, in mind the potential cost reductions there based upon you know, maximizing resources, uh, as well as the, the incorporation of the trail component. This might be a good place for me to correct an error I think I made earlier this presentation, I think I mentioned a figure of 186 million total, I think it's 130 million. So 130 for the whole thing. Yeah, the whole plan is, is shown. Yes, yeah, well, that's something that's a pleasure to have going on. <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah, I just reduced it by a third, so I think that form of paper. Somebody hand me a Master Trails plan from last time? Yeah, so this is our new way.